Good morning. Uh, my name is Sam Abrams. I'm a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute and a professor of politics and social science at Sarah Lawrence College here in uh, New York. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the American Enterprise Institute and another Edward and Helen Hintz uh, Book Forum event. Uh, simply put, American journalism today is under attack. In this age of intense polarization, many major news outlets face pressure to push so-called politically correct narratives under the guise of objective, unbiased reporting. So the question for today is, has the so-called fourth estate, the institution that's largely uh, responsible for checking the government, providing information to the citizenry, uh, and so on, fallen prey to a rising uh, pressure from uh, the woke or the pressure to be woke. Uh, today, uh, Bacha Angar Sargon, uh, the deputy ed opinion editor at Newsweek, says yes. Uh, she has a forthcoming book. Uh, it's a great cover. I know we're not supposed to judge books by uh, their covers, but this is a great cover um, called Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. Uh, Dr. Angar Sargon chronicles the radical shifts uh, in American journalism uh, over the last uh, few years and what it means uh, for democracy uh, as a whole. Uh, I'm looking forward to exploring this with everyone today and to help me do that, uh, a number of guests. Uh, first, uh, Bacha uh, Angar Sargon is the deputy editor of Newsweek. Before that, she was the opinion editor of The Forward, the largest Jewish media outlet in uh, America. And she's written extensively for places like the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, uh, to name a few. Uh, she also uh, holds a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley and uh, when her book comes out in about a week, uh, go get it. It's fantastic. Uh, we are also joined uh, by Virginia Heffernan, uh, who is currently a contributor at uh, Wired. Uh, she's the author of Magic and Loss, uh, The Internet as Art. Uh, she's been around uh, the tech world for years. Uh, I look forward to talking to her uh, offline more about tech. Uh, I was around during uh, Web 1.0 and 2.0 out in Palo Alto. Uh, amazing times uh, and, and so much still to be written about that. Uh, before joining uh, the staff at Wired, she worked for the New York Times and uh, is currently an op-ed columnist uh, for the uh, LA Times. Uh, she also, like Bacha, has a PhD, uh, and this PhD is uh, from Harvard. Um, she likes to say that uh, she stumbled onto the internet uh, in uh, 1979 uh, when it was in a back office thing. Now it's pervasive, and uh, I can't wait to hear her views on this. And uh, finally, uh, Thomas Chatterton Williams, uh, who's also a fellow uh, with me at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, a columnist for Harper's uh, Magazine and uh, a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine. Um, he has uh, influenced quite a bit of my thinking and my students' thinking. Uh, his memoir, Self-Portrait in Black and White, Unlearning Race, uh, created, I would say, at least three two-hour seminar heated sets of exchanges with my students, and I thank you for that. Uh, it, it's just such a provocative, wonderful uh, piece of work. His essays can be found all over the place, including uh, the Best American Essays Anthology. Uh, Mr. Williams has his uh, MA uh, uh, in Cultural Reporting and Criticism from NYU and uh, his BA in Philosophy from uh, Georgetown. And I just want to step back and say for a minute, um, thank you, Bacha, for joining us here at AEI. I've noticed a lot of chatter of late on, in social media about AEI and universities. Are we, do we care about viewpoint diversity? Are we bringing in people we disagree with? Is there really enough diversity of thought? And I, I want to say that I um, consider Bacha a friend. We've known each other for a number of years now. And uh, I think, uh, not to put words in your mouth, but I've heard you refer to yourself as a lefty and a socialist many times. And uh, I'm none of those things. I'm uh, much more conservative than that. Uh, I think we're both proudly Jewish, but socialist, no way. I think it's wrong. We can talk about it, not today. But whether I agree with you or not, your book and your ideas are so important. Your insights are so important. And at AEI, and just like I think what univer university should be, uh, and just like Thomas's wonderful letter that you helped spearhead for uh, Harper's, which unfortunately was slammed, I will talk more about that later. This is what you know, discourse is about. This is about bringing people together who have different views, different ways of seeing the world. And great, we disagree, but I still respect the heck out of Baja, uh, admire her, consider her a friend, and want to have, uh, you know, you at a table when it's safe, uh, you know, to, to hear your views. And we can respect and admire each other and disagree with each other. This is something that's being lost in the academy. I talk about this all the time in my own writing. And something that I, I've seen AI be accused of uh, recently, and I would say that's just the opposite. At AI, we value ideas and opinions. We want more speech, more opinions, more debate, more dialogue. And thank you, Bacha, for being a socialist and for joining us and being willing to join us at, a, at an institution where uh, our focus is on 
free enterprise and market <laughs> as elevating uh, the world. Uh, so uh, it, it's just kind of amusing, but um, I think this is exactly where uh, think tanks, higher ed, and and you know, basically what we should be doing in, 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 with public discourse. And, and I think this is a, a virtue. That being said, uh, I'm not 100% today, a little under the weather. So let me do a brief introduction and then throw it to our uh, really thoughtful and interesting guests. Uh, so um, Botch's book uh, makes the argument that, uh, quote, today's left has by and large abandoned the working class to fight a culture war around issues of identity. Instead of building an agenda around the needs of actual working class Americans of all races, uh, who tend to be more conservative. The left today is pushing highly niche issues rooted Ivy League universities. I was there watching that, like wokeness and cancel culture and anti-Zionism and open borders, things that are really alien to most working class Americans, no matter who they vote for. Uh, and Bacha then basically in this book says there's an institution known as the media, and they have taken on the following view. Um, quote, it is the belief that America is an unrepentant white supremacist state that confers power and privilege on white people, uh, which is system, excuse me, which it systematically denies to people of color. Those who hold this view believe an interconnected network of racist institutions infects every level of society, culture, and politics, imprisoning us all in a power binary, I hate binaries personally, based on race, <laughs> regardless of our economic circumstances. And the solution, according to those who hold this view, is not to reform institutions that still struggle with racism, but to transform the consciousness of everyday Americans until we prioritize race over everything else. Uh, if you look at what, uh, what I've written, I obviously think this is a flawed uh, view. Uh, but Batya takes this view on as saying, this is what's dominating newsrooms today. And we've shifted from a world of blue collar tradesmen, if you will, or tradespeople, uh, to now uh, an elite profession where these individuals maintain this view. And that is why we see a woke news uh, system that we have today. Um, so I'd like to pause and ask Baja, um, how'd you get there? Um, why did you write this book now? And, and walk us through, if you don't mind, uh, how this book came together and, and this view came, uh, you put this view together. So first of all, thank you so much to AEI for having me. Thank you, B, for organizing this event. And Sam, thank you so much for your thought leadership and your commitment to intellectual diversity. I'm so honored to be here. I also really, really have to thank Virginia and Thomas. Um, you know, my book uh, is um, at times scathing, but I tried very hard to maintain a sort of generous reading of why people are pushing the woke narrative, because I think a lot of people do this from a place of, of uh, really, really wanting to see a better world. And Virginia is often my model for that. I picture Virginia because it is impossible to picture her doing anything for any reason except the best reason. And and Thomas, um, you, you, aside Aside from the uh, intellectual leadership you show, you have brought a moral leadership to a very, very difficult time and difficult space. Um, every day you show up on Twitter, which is the most horrible place, and you are kind to the people who are the most cruel to you. And so I feel so deeply honored to be in both of your company right now and um, to be here uh, talking about my book. So thank you both so, so much. Um, how come my book exists? So I would say that there are sort of three primal scenes at the heart of this book. The first is when I found out about a 2018 Yale study. And the study found that there was a difference between how white liberals and white conservatives spoke to people of color. And it found that white liberals dumbed down their vocabulary when talking to black and Latino people and that conservatives do not. And I remember thinking to myself, there is a sickness in the worldview that produces that behavior. And again, that behavior clearly comes from a misguided place of, you know, wanting to help, right? Wanting to be good, wanting not to embarrass somebody by using, you know, like, you know, six syllable words or whatever, but it's sick, it's a sickness. And I remember having this moment of clarity that, you know, it didn't like blossom into my full blown worldview yet, but it was definitely a moment for me of like, what are we doing here that that has happened to us and then we are calling the conservatives racists when they're the ones who don't do this so that was sort of the first primal scene i would say the second was learning about the uh, the deaths of despair and the downward mobility among um 
the uh, working <clears throat> the working class in America, particularly the working class that's being lost by Democrats and lost by the liberals. Um, the idea that people feel so hopeless that they are literally killing themselves with alcoholism, with drug, um, opioid um, overdoses, and with suicides, and that those are the people again who are being shown the most contempt by the liberals. These people who clearly are losing out of the American dream and yet who somehow our side, my side, the lefty side has become okay with that because of what their political views are. And I would say the third primal scene is one that Sam, you were actually there for, which was I tried to write a different book actually and I couldn't sell it. And that book was about American unity. Um, the polling has shown seismic change on the right around a host of issues that are really at the beating heart of the liberal worldview, issues like sexism and racism and LGBTQ rights, we just are not divided along those issues anymore. The left really won a lot of those cultural battles, and yet nobody knows it and nobody talks about it. And so I wanted to write a book called A More Perfect Union about how united we are as Americans around the most important issues at stake in American life, the values this nation was founded on. Finally, we're united around those issues. And I couldn't sell that book. Nobody would buy it. Editors kept saying to me, who is the audience for this? And finally, a very kind editor sat me down and she said, look, you know, nobody's going to buy a book telling them something that seems so implausible. If we're so united, why do we think we're so divided? Write that book. And, and I think that's sort of the book that I did write. Hmm. So, um, so uh, Virginia, if you want to jump in on that, uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, by all means, please, or, or I can start with some prompts, whatever you uh, like. First off, I, well, Batya is my constant interlocutor. We have to tip our hand on that. Um, so I've refined lots of my thinking in conversation with her, um, public and otherwise. I, um, I heartily agree. And I think before you wrote this book, we agreed about this hypothesis of yours that we have a more perfect union. Um, I'll give you just one example. In spite of the, you know, books, bestseller book, bestselling books called Polarized, um, uh, I don't know if you are following, anyone is following the vaccination rates in this country, but for 65 and over, it is 96% uh, have had at least one shot. So we've talked a lot in the, in the so-called media about um, anti-vaxxers and people willing to um, die for would-be libertarian politics. Um, that seems, if we define anti-vaxxers as people who wouldn't have a sh one shot of the vaccine, that is that represents 4% and shrinking um, among people over 65. So look, we're all getting the vaccine. Um, we've discovered, in spite of some tussling over these new bills, that people were willing to vote for, and all our representatives willing to vote for an enormous um, you know, bailout bill um, during and and uh, social services, um, social programs bill in the form of the two relief bills during COVID. You know, things that um, Richard Gordy used to say, some of these things are decided under our feet. So you can have a huge debate about, uh, you know, something like racism writ large, or you can have a huge debate about the welfare state. But uh, the debate goes on. And then the and then and then the the tectonics plates move without us even thinking about it. Um, I will say that the uh, on the subject of racism and who really knows exactly you know what that designates now. But um, but I was listening to Clarence Thomas now what now thirty years ago, um, almost thirty years ago, twenty five years ago. Um, his his heart his defense of himself um, against the charges leveled by Anita Hill. And they were, um, you know, we, we remember that he said high tech lynching, but he worked out that metaphor so powerfully um, using rope as an analogy, analogously to the cameras that he felt um, he under the pressure of. And, um, and at that time, even people like Jeff Sessions were really taking pains to guard themselves against charges of racism. Incidentally, no one um, criticized Clarence Thomas for using this idiom to talk about what was very much not a lynching ending in the death of a black man. Um, but it was very powerful. And I think his defense partly worked because there was a shared idea that um, that that um, that racism had been, um, you know, had destroyed, especially especially virulent exterminationist racism, like 
like we saw during um, Jim Crow and slavery, was a touchstone for pain and a touchstone for pain that we all could agree was pain. Um, and, and I think that has slipped away somewhat. There's a certain amount of doubt that has crept in around even certifications of uh, like 20th century suffering that we used to all agree on. I mean, the Holocaust is a great example, which is the touchstone of meaning uh, for, for most of us interested in the history of Europe. Um, for in the 20th century, and um, and somehow, of all things, instead of sort of being indifferent to the suffering, there's been an element of doubt about the suffering. And uh, you know, I'm I'm reminded of um, uh, of uh, this great line from Elaine Scarry that I can't um, and I can't get I kind of can't get out of my head. I hope I hope you'll spend a minute thinking about this. She has in the Body and Pain, her book, The Body and Pain. She has uh, lays out an epistemology around pain and suffering, um, and her argument is to to have pain is to have certainty, to hear about pain is to have doubt. That even in a small way, if someone says I have a headache, there's a little bit of skepticism that creeps in. Where if you yourself have a migraine, you yourself have Lyme disease syndrome, you yourself encounter, you know, have a um, have a fearsome allostatic load, as um, as Jason Johnson calls it, because of the racism you've suffered. That seems plain as day to you. Um, but the pain of other people, including those with shit life syndrome, or with um, or with uh, you know who are suffering from diseases of despair or addiction, as I suffered from for a long time, um, you are absolutely sure that your pain is not only you know beyond unimpeachably true, but that it takes precedence over the pain of others. Um, and um, and I think that there is you know a willingness when both 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 uh, Sam and Batya talk to say that a certain kind of pain, let's say, let's say uh, uh, religious discrimination and bigotry um, is real or classism is real. Those are, th that, that's a kind of suffering that feels palpable um, to you. Where other kinds of suffering, say this allostatic load that lots of, you know, what you might call, what, what the two of you might call wokes, like Jason Johnson say they suffer from is somewhat less, somehow less real. Or the suffering of the, P the followers of Jordan Peterson, you know, the the uh, the sort of right wing uh, folklore expert who's become a hero to, to young men. Um, you know, he he has, and I think some people on the right who you quote in your book, including um, Connor, uh, is it sorry, Frieders? Tell me, remind me of his last name, um, Batya Friedersdorf. But I, I don't think he identifies as on the right. But well, please, no, go ahead. I, think, yeah. I think he identifies okay. as a liberal. Yes. Very liberal. Center, all right. Yes. All right. Center left. <laughs> I think he's libertarian. But... Okay. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah. Well, who knows what these names mean anymore? But, um, but, it, but who certainly um, objects to some kinds of identity politics? Maybe he calls himself my least favorite thing, a classical liberal. That's my least favorite. I think I, I prefer the romantic or jazz liberals. Um, but in any case, he, uh, he, uh, he, he has said a very interesting thing about, about Jordan Peterson, who also, I think, is signatory to the Harper's letter, or at least a no, sympathizer no. with the Harper's letter. No, okay. Um, um, he, uh, that Jordan Peterson, incidentally, also a pill addict, um, says um, that possibly the followers of men like him um, feel that their suffering lies in their fear of, of death, um, their fear of, you know, uh, not meeting their reproductive potential, um, these kind of existential fears that that belong to white men, you know, if Hamlet or if uh, if Winston Churchill or something is our paradigm, his suffering is real, you know, his suffering is real, and the rest of our suffering deserves a little bit of skepticism. Well, the Jordan Peterson followers see themselves as plenty troubled plenty upset and dislike that the suffering of black people or say women or 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 uh, or you know other marginalized groups jews is less important is somehow less important or less real than that suffering so i get 
that the suffering, that class suffering is real. I mean, I class, race, and gender were the three ways, you know, you sliced, slice and dice experience um, uh, when I, at least was, when I was in graduate school with the constant conversation about which one came first. And it is just a tedious conversation. And I think grounded in this epistemology that Elaine Scarry points out, sometimes people refer to it as the oppression Olympics, who has it worse, right? Um, and what I what I might come down to is it might come down to is that I think that the media and I still am confused about what counts as the woke media. I think I'm the only one here who's worked in a newsroom, and it was very hard to see evidence of um, uh, that somehow are the work of you know getting the story about um, a hurricane in in Houston was somehow inflected with you know something like wokeness which still again i have a hard time getting a definition on but i i mean i really didn't know how people voted um at the new york times um when i was there um but uh sorry i've lost my way a little bit but the you know i guess the point is that um we're supposed to accept that um possibly um by sam someone with sam's politics a kind of pro-capitalist free pro free markets person that suffering comes in the way that the hero of the fountainhead suffers that there are too many critics who've who've um restrained his awesome freedoms um and uh, you know something like peter Thiel, another critic of the wokes who says you know that there are certain um kinds of imaginations that are inhibited by this kind of we idea of we um, and, um, and, and yet, Sam, your reference, you know, I think is germane, your reference to um, that you and Batia share religious commitments, um, religious commitments that I, I also have, um, is, you know, another way of saying that it's not an entirely individualist project for you, um, or an entirely individualist project project for, um, for really any of us. And yet we have individual suffering. Um, so um, that nobody takes seriously, you know, um, I mean, or at least nobody fully accepts as as powerful as their as their suffering. Um, so I guess I, what I resist in Batia's argument is some idea that um, the complaints of the ro the wokes and as I say, this uh, uh, allo uh, allostatic load is one of them. That you know, the idea that racism causes some t wear and tear on the body that you know, you're regularly confronted with racism and that you know, actually hurts your body. And you could certainly say that victims of Me Too incidents, sexual assault and so forth, have actual suffering in their body. You don't have to imagine it um, if they've been hurt or bruised. Um, and um, and you know, now we're being asked to imagine that the suffering, like let's take, let's take the, the argument that the newspapers or the, the media is anti-Zionist, that the suffering of Jews in Europe that gave rise in part to the to the Jewish state is somehow more important and needs more more uh, uh, ink spilled on it than the suffering of Indigenous people in the U.S. or Indigenous people in the in um, in in um, in Israel. You know, I don't or whether or not they are indigenous. I mean, I don't want to get into in the into the weeds, but I think this is a conversation about suffering. I wish, for, frankly, that the New York Times still had its neediest cases division part, because we do need some touchstone to imagine what a kind of group suffering looks like. Um, and I think, you know, currently, if it's ascendant to imagine that the allostatic load enforced on people from systemic racism or during uh, Jody Cantor's reporting on the meet on, uh, on the Harvey Weinstein thing, that there's some kind of unique suffering because of gender bias um, and and assault, gender based assault in the workplace. These are we go through periods like this. And I think that the kind of certainty of our politics lies in the certainty of what we see as pain and being asked to imagine religious ba religion based suffering and it, it is more important somehow or class based suffering is more important than other kinds of suffering is just another way of slicing and dicing the polity. Um, and um, and I'm not sure represents you know, more or less progress or even a very robust critique. Thomas, any uh, thoughts and response? That was uh, a lot to take on. <laughs> sure. Well, first, I want to say thank you for such a wonderful um, introduction. And thank you, Batia, also. And 
I'm just going to, I guess, uh, tip my hand too. I uh, identify as a liberal, but I, I have a very strong interest in um, kind of uh, dialogue and exchange and mutual uh, understanding and the attempt to forge new alliances with people from other camps who share similar values or are trying to achieve a similar world, um, even if you don't agree on everything. Um, and I should also just say that I just really thought Bacha's book is really persuasive and, and, and was really thrilled to blurb it. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I think what I'm hearing is some of what Virginia was saying, I, I, I disagree with just because I think I start um, from a very different premise as a, as, as a descendant of, uh, of slaves, of American slaves, uh, whose father is old enough to be uh, a grandfather and who grew up uh, in the segregated South under Jim Crow. I don't actually think that my suffering is most real. I have always profoundly been aware that um, actually uh, in contrast, direct contrast to my father's life, my suffering isn't so significant. And actually I think that there's a lot of uh, what I tend to hear among, um, I guess I would call my elite peers at uh, top tier media platforms and uh, really nice universities that you'll pay off for decades if uh, someone doesn't pay it for you. Uh, what I hear from them is a kind of complaint and a kind of uh, catastrophization that seems unreal to me because I compare it to something that I think of as being much more real than what I find myself or those I encounter in my milieu uh, dealing with. So I just want to flip that. And I think that what Batya really... Um, is getting at in her book, and it takes a lot of courage to write a book called Bad News and to kind of um, go against that kind of feeling of triumphant uh, moralism that is everywhere found at top tier media platforms now. I, I mean, I wish you could write a book called Good News because I actually think that that would be truer to what we're experiencing, but we're not allowed to admit. Um, so that's, that's kind of, I guess, the, how I would just start off and would love to bring Bacha back in. Well, I think to me, the thing that came up for me while you were speaking, Virginia, and again, thank you so much, both of you. This is just thrilling. Um, is that I don't know that my book is about suffering. Um, I think to me, the problem with today is it, I really think that um, um, uh, the, 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 the rubric of using something emotional or personal like suffering to measure what should be political is a huge part of the problem. And to me, is very much part of this kind of like meritocratic elite, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, used to be called bourgeois, right? Like the idea that the things that happen in a person's heart are more important than what happens outside in the real world in the political mm -hmm. realm. We mm -hmm. have personalized and privatized politics. Um, and, and I think that that is one of the major problems. And, and um, it's not a reason I think we should move to a class-based model. I think the reason to move to a class-based model is because um, so many working class people are people of color and they are being ignored by both parties. And I think that the woke language is, um, it's sort of, it, it's a masquerade of social justice that makes um, affluent people feel like they're doing something when they're actually not doing something. So to me, the idea of a class-based politics, a socialist politics that you know prioritizes the needs of labor and the working class really is about combating you know the vestiges of racism and the ways in which we have income gaps um, um, from a place that would actually be more real and more political. Um, so to me, the focus on who is suffering I, I take your point. Obviously, we all feel, you know, our own suffering. You know, Adam Smith made that point in the theory of moral sentiments, right? When you see someone about to hit somebody, you go, oh, right? But the minute they hit the person and the person cries out, you go, hmm, isn't he crying a little bit too much, right? Like the kind <laughs> yes, of yes. human nature. Um, it's a really good point. But I think to me, the the problem is, is the focus on suffering as opposed to the focus on solidarity and coalition mm -hmm. building, as Thomas said, and and the idea that um, there is a political realm, a public realm beyond our personal, uh, you know, private striving that matters more than what is in each individual person's heart. And that is the thing I think we've lost in America. We've lost a sense of the public, a sense mm -hmm. of that there is a place beyond our individual needs and beyond our individual scope that matters, that's worth like not insulting someone on Twitter, because what if, you know, you could find something 
in common with them and mm -hmm. actually create a larger coalition that is actually multiracial. And, and just, I think Thomas has really um, opened our eyes to the, uh, what the polling shows, which is that a lot of the woke ideology is very foreign to working class people of all races, including the majority of black Americans and, and Latino Americans who continue to vote for Democrats um, for historical reasons, a lot of them justified. But I guess the point of my book is, um, in a way, you know, the, the, that the liberals have stopped doing anything for them in return. Um, so it's kind of a response to Thomas Frank's book, What's the Matter with Kansas? In fact, when I wrote the proposal for this book, I was calling it What's the Matter with Liberals? Um, and so I, I think we do share a lot of commitments to what, you know, about questions as well. What are the biggest problems facing America? It's just a question of how do we achieve those, um, those, those goals. But um, yeah, I want to hear more from both of you. Um, and if I could just chime in for one second, you know, it, it's um, I actually agree with you, Bajia, completely on this, that if you go into a college classroom at an elite school um, today, it's all about identity. And it's what I call the victimization Olympics. Um, when you meet people, uh, they're going to tell you uh, a host of uh, factors about themselves that usually intends to transmit some sense of harm. I'm this, therefore I've been hurt this way. I'm that, so I've been hurt that way. And when I introduce, when I first meet students, I reject that immediately and say, that's fine. I, I don't care about your gender, your race, your ethnicity, any of that. Uh, let's try to find something that we can all agree on. You know, who are we as a class? What are we here to do collectively as a community? But, you know, I, I you know, I'm troubled by the idea that the, the, the entire woke framework uh, demands taking on this, this sort of mantle of victimization. And in doing so, um, makes it harder to find unity, makes it harder to move anything uh, sort of forward makes it harder for us to 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 recognize our potential. And I say elite schools because, like with your book, and we, you know, I, what I liked about it is it does show this transformation from sort of the working beats from the small local newspapers, right, to to sort of the, these much more prestigious jobs. And if you take a look at who's getting them nowadays, they're people who come from elite jur uh, you know journalism backgrounds or have the money to do substacks or whatever uh, without having to worry too much about money at, at this point. Um, research shows over and over and over again that, uh, and, and this is work we do at AEI, that that those uh, students from more elite backgrounds are fixated on identity politics, fixated on race, ethnicity, culture, and that victimization. And when you go to less prestigious schools with students of lower socioeconomic backgrounds, the botches point, they don't care. They don't want to talk about it. They're there to learn. They're there to get the skills. And they're there to move on. And this is sort of this big cleavage we're beginning to see. Uh, and, and, and I actually agree that the, the Democrats uh, don't know how to play it and are, are pushing harder and harder on this uh, identity politic thing. The Republicans have some ground to gain here if they would talk about the bigger macro picture of unity. Of course, they're struggling with that a little bit uh, as well. But I, I think to, to Bacha's point, we're seeing this play out not just in newsrooms, but we're seeing it happen among our G's, Gen Z, excuse me, uh, undergrads and, uh, you know, just basic uh, population uh, around the country now. And it started with the millennials and it's certainly um, as prominent with the Gen Zers today. I don't know who we're talking about when we talk about the elite, uh, just as I don't know quite who we're talking about when we talk about the woke. I mean, the elite, uh, I've just reviewed a, a, a very good biography of Peter Thiel um, and Peter Thiel designated as elite, you know, obviously like, like all of us, he, um, he he was from the elite. He was at Stanford, but it, so someone that might be identified as elite um, by uh, you know any Joe. I mean any relative of mine um, is usually the person using the word elite to criticize um, to criticize other people. I think the working class in general calls elite the rich. Um, and, um, and, but okay. So uh, I'm reminded of a, a, um, a uh, when I was first writing about the internet and, it, you know, just to put all cards on the table, um, you know, I think it's not wokeness or even any trend, um, in the media with one exception, um, or even the rise of Donald Trump that have, um, changed everything. You know, if I were going to, if I were going to point to one, um, I think there's like a Matt Groening co column about an old academic, old academics and what they're like. And the, the one that he zeroes in on is the one that says, he who controls magnesium controls the earth. <laughs> um, so if I, if I were gonna say, what is my sort of one thing, I would say it's digitization that has mm -hmm. enacted a kind of 
insult to brains and um and so and we're sort of still still grappling with what's been done fragment uh, fragmented our languages and um and thrown a lot of things up in the air for good nil um but um okay once again i'm, I'm losing my way this is so immensely interesting um Oh yes. Uh, so um, when you know some of the few f the few times I was brought in for real breaking news at the New York Times was one of them was when Saddam Hussein was um, was executed in in Iraq, and um, the New York Times had reported that his last words were uh, "death to the Zionists and death to America, the great enemy of the West." Um, and um, and and look at that. He was mad at exactly the same things we thought he would be mad at. This is what Iraqi officials told the New York Times. Well, I don't know if you remember this, but a video um, snuck out, probably by you know a, a an Iraqi onlooker who had had brought a camera and should have should have had a Pulitzer Prize for this kind of reporting, and managed you know to smuggle it out. And it was the first time I you know, it's the first time I ever saw gallows. Um, you know, and at the time I was carefully monitoring some very unsavory sites um, on the web. Uh, LiveLeak was the one formerly called Ogrish um, that had like very disturbing video from Iraq and the, and this thing leaked to it. Um, and I, what I, I called um, Bill Keller, then the editor to say, this is not what happened. Um, his last words were not um, uh, death to Zion, to the Zionists and death to America. They were Mustafa, 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 right? What? Why? Why was that the last thing on his mind? It was the last thing on his mind because Mustafa was his enemy in Tikrit, where he grew up. I think you might see where I'm going with this, but just we're in the, the elites where we wish that we were at war with, with another class. Um, but, but in fact, we're just at war with each other. We're just curious that like someone in our, you know, class at Harvard, uh, you know, started to complain more about or or at Sarah Lawrence complained more about the fact that she's been date raped than about, you know, um, structures in the free market or other things that we think should be determining her life. I mean, you know, I don't know when um, undergraduates were not completely self-obsessed with drawing a connection between the ways they grew up and the things they had endured and great social trends. They just don't have much to call on, right? And, um, and you know, I just finished, I'm also just finished rereading God and Man at Yale, the William Buckley, uh, um, one of the first anti-woke treatises um, in, in 1951. Um, and Buckley in it has two major complaints. Now this is in an all white, all male, student body. So he's not complaining about anything we might call political correctness. He's complaining, the second one you're going to like, Sam, the first one is nobody's Christian enough that even the, you know, many collared members of the clergy who are his professors are allowing for a little agnosticism in the classroom. And not just that they're not religious or they're, they're not open to uh, students, you know, Jewish students or other, other, other historically marginalized Jewish populations, that they're not professing that Jesus Christ was the son of God on a regular basis in economics classes. So, wow, that's a big thing. Um, and the second thing he thinks is if they've, if they've shunted God to the side, they've made a God of someone else he objects to. Sam, ready for this? Mm -hmm. Maynard Keynes. Maynard Keynes, yeah. right? That's his <laughs> other main objection. I mean, I'm not sure that anyone, even in the elite, no matter how we define them, remembers exactly who Maynard Keynes is, except that we're always being told we're Keynesians now, and are we Keynesians? And Keynes, Keynes may have something to do with collectivism. I'm sure he's an enemy of yours, Sam, or I'm imagining he is. Not um, really, no. Good. <laughs> okay. uh, we agree on way too much then. Um, but but the point is that we, you know, we've always thought that our classrooms you know, that people were either too conservative or too liberal in our classrooms and then try to make a Mustafa cause out of that. You know, he like Saddam Hussein, still fighting his little like sharks and jets battle with someone from Tikrit. I know I'm doing it. You know, I, I, you know, I know I'm constantly thinking that people I just like must be to the right of me and must be the you know, <laughs> noxious end of the world. Um, and then it's important always to design my ideology so that it has certain people in its sights, you know, and a certain sentimental people, you know, a sentimental vision of the people that I, that I, uh, you know, I don't know, Thomas, if you imagine, um, 
relatives of yours um, uh, who suffered under segregation the way that I imagine my Appalachian relatives. But I definitely will take some time to tell you that it's West Virginia that's been left out of everything and that all our resources should go to Senator Joe Manchin because those are my people. And I have like some, you know, some sentimental attachment to them, more than sentimental, some actual attachment to them. So I think the uh, maybe we can talk about what the definition of elite is. I mean, it's laughable how the four of us, um, you know, meet the criteria for the professional class and for, you know, in our educations. Um, and I think we're turning on, you know, some of our peers that rub us the wrong way and passing them off as political arguments. I completely agree with Batya that the, these things turn into like little skirmishes instead of you know, especially enlightened conversations about what we might do with politics. But no, the, the rosebud idea of, you know, what, what about that sled from Citizen Kane? These, <laughs> these moments in our childhood, whether it's uh, in college, high school, or even yes. earlier, absolutely still define us. Um, so we're getting a ton of questions coming in. So before we do that, I want to just ask Thomas a, a question, if you don't mind. And it relates to um, a comment uh, that, that uh, Bacha wrote. And you had written about, yeah, and I like this. You write, journalists who dissent from this worldview, i.e. the sort of woke, woke worldview, have learned to keep their mouths shut or face massive public censure and humiliation or even lose those jobs. And those jobs are few and far between. I think that um, that's certainly the case in higher education. In, in my own world, I kept my mouth shut for years until uh, I had tenure. And, and shortly after tenure, I sent something to the New York Times and boom, uh, you know, I had death threats a couple days later and my office was vandalized and, and so on. Um, so what are we to make of this? How are people to speak out? Um, and Thomas, I, I'm so impressed by your willingness to speak the way you, you've done it. And it seems, uh, and I, I hope I'm right about this, that your your career and your writing continues to flourish, even though you may not be, um, you know, in line with these newsrooms and some of these outlets. Uh, so please keep writing. But, you know, how, how do you see this in, in Bacha's comment uh, on, on people who, you know, sort of differ or deviate from the norms? Um, um... Well, you know, I, it's a complicated question because, you know, I think that you have to, if, if you're going to be a writer or if you're going to want to think publicly, then you really can only do that because you believe that um, there are things that are correct or there, there are ways of describing the world that are um, truer than other ways, mm -hmm. and you would you would need to do that and need to say that, uh, regardless of um, you can't position you can't make your positions fit what you think the the the, the industry wants to reward. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not worth doing it. I, I think I think it would be an unbearable uh, job, and it wouldn't be um, the most remunerative. Remunit remunerative work you should go do something in silicon valley with peter Thiel or something. um and you know this touches on what both batya and virginia were talking about what is an elite yes peter Thiel is certainly one sort of elite but there are multiple elites in the in a complex society like america and there's a cultural elite and oftentimes they're very angry and probably internally seething because they're more refined, they have more, more culture, they have more education, um, and they're so less well compensated than a kind of uh, uncouth vulgar elite. Uh, and oftentimes these, uh, you know, these two um, types of elites uh, self-sort uh, in, in our binary political system. <laughs> and you know, uh, you know, it's true that there's a cultural capital that writers and media people participate in, but it's it, it's a legit. Uh oh, did you lose it? I'm sure uh, he'll be did, back. Did you, okay, I'm sure he'll jump back on. Um, so while he uh, jumps back on, let me just ask uh, one final question uh, to the two of you. Uh, oh, you're back. Sorry, okay. I don't. I, I'm not elite enough to have a stable internet connection. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe no, well, that's a structural elite. solution, Batya. <laughs> Google elite doesn't have the same level of tech yet. Um, or is it the socialist government in France that limits? <laughs> <all the people laughs> I think Sam's been vindicated. Sorry, I had to go there. <laughs> Social democracy sucks. <laughs> um, but I have healthcare and and and, and daycare. Um, but you know, like to, to your question, Sam, I, I don't want to give that short shrift because I think that uh, I probably have been penalized in certain ways that matter, but I can't uh, prove it. Um, but mm -hmm. how can you ever uh, 
talk about the fellowships that you didn't get, the you know the 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 opportunity you were about to get it at Princeton or somewhere that then for some reason didn't happen, even though someone told you it was coming your way. These things happen all the time, but they also happen for reasons that don't have anything conspiratorial behind them. So you just don't know. I mean, at one point, David Remnick said to me that how can cancel culture really be that important? Because, you know, you see, you, you wrote for me and you've been for other places. And it's like, that's true. But first of all, there's no guarantee that tomorrow I will continue to. And also, you know, I think that if I'm really honest, uh, I have an identity that gives me some amount of cover. It's just enough, uh, but I don't, but, and I mean that I'm actually not uh, white. Uh, I, I trace my ancestry to um, one of the primary oppressed groups. So I'm allowed begrudgingly a little bit of latitude in what I'm able to say in some of these venues that, that I don't think I would be able to say if I didn't have that. Um, kind of uh, a standpoint uh, uh, authority in the way that the, the way that the conversation works today. I do just want to point out that Virginia also knows that she lost many opportunities for writing a piece about her belief in God from the right. And so it's just so interesting always talking to you, Virginia, because you have had that experience that I think a lot of people are experiencing now, but from the other side of the political aisle. Yeah, actually, that 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 was from the left. That was um, oh, that's right, that's right, that's failure right. Failure of scientism. Um, yeah, well, what I what I saw as scientism, um, and um, and did amount to me uh, going to income zero and job retraining and marketing. I had to leave journalism. So I don't know about the. I don't know. I mean, I, right? You can't calculate the opportunities you've missed. But um, but in this case, you know, I was at Yahoo News. Marissa Mayer explicitly said. You know, she felt humiliated by this piece that had been, you know, warmly welcomed by readers of Yahoo News. In fact, I was given a lifetime family pass to the Creationism Museum. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but the uh, but the left um, labeled me um, hashtag worse than ISIS. At least that was one of the criticisms. Um, and um, and this was in the heyday of the you know especially robust atheists, um, including. You know Sam Harris and and the and the Dawkins crowd, um, and uh, and that was bruising. On the other hand, um, and Sam, I'm, uh, that's terrible that you're, you know, these threats going kinetic. That your office was vandalized. Um, I haven't act actually had threats um, go kinetic, um, it, although the ones inspired by Tucker Carlson, um, you know, the endless stream of death threats that I still get um, that are just so. Um, terrifying that, you know, I mean, terrifying sounding, so cortisol producing that I um, I have called the police and the FBI about those, but nothing has ever turned into actual bodily or harm to property. So uh, that's terrible to hear that. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 the far right, and, and I think Thomas and I have this in common, I don't have a great deal of sympathy for, um, for, you know, the, the crime family of the Trumps, um, and uh, it, you know, just not elected by the majority, never a majority president, never speaking to, um, you know, it was hard to see who he was talking to. I mean, there's 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 no American who doesn't think that who there's no American who believes that when their relative and in Mississippi one in something like one in eight people is, has had COVID um, that really can maintain a belief for very long this thing was, a, that the virus was a hoax. It's very hard to imagine that he was really um, talking to his constituency when he refused to get on and put the country on a so-called war footing and treat COVID. Um, and so if Mississippians who voted for Trump um, were well served by him, they weren't so well served that he protected them from getting sick. Um, and uh, and that's that that I think has been a very um, sad state of affairs. As for Trumpites themselves, um, I'm not sure they seem to be misrepresented in a million ways. Um, but Batya, I'll agree. I'll I'll uh, I'll completely agree with you. You know, I gave you the statistic about 65 and over have had one shot of the um, one shot of uh, uh, you know of the of the vaccine, and um, they we might say. Well, they know that they're like in a special threat group, or maybe they've managed to work around disinformation or something else. The short answer is they are all they all have Medicare. 
These are the only mm -hmm. group on the list who are actually used to having social services. Um, and in my efforts to persuade, hand persuade people to get the vaccine, two of them said, no one has ever showed concern about me before, mm -hmm. right? You know, if you're used to getting help from your government, Thomas lives with free health and national health insurance, Bhatia and I agitate for it. If you're used to that, it doesn't matter if you're a Trumpite or you believe it's a hoax. All those things come out of being abandoned by your government, that you start to find weird solutions. Um, and and I think the solutions, if we're, if we're going back to politics and away from personal experience, the solutions are the obvious ones um, and certainly... Um, some of them are, are social programs that veer toward the socialist, in my view. So let me just ask one final quick question uh, to Bacha, and then we do have to open up since we have uh, quite a few guests. Um, and that is, I, I think a lot about uh, undergrads. Um, they don't always have the greatest attention spans. They mean certainly well. Um, if so much, you know, and, and I always encourage, um, you know, people to read as many sources as possible uh, on the uh, uh, you know, on the way out, uh, we get two uh, newspapers delivered. My three-year-old said, uh, why do we have two newspapers? And for the first time <laughs> a few hours ago, I said, we have a liberal one and a conservative one. And, uh, and we just said, okay, and went on his way. Um, but, you know, if, 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 if Botch's narrative is correct, uh, and uh, I think there's an awful lot of truth to it, um, what are we supposed to do with our younger uh, Americans? You know, they're not necessarily going to take the time to read a hard copy newspaper. They're certainly not necessarily going to do the work to read various blogs, follow all the tweets, um, uh, necessarily, you know, compare and try to find a clear narrative thread. So how do we move forward from this? Um, and then I'd love to open it up to some of uh, the, the audience. Um, so I think to me, a large part of the problem is the uh, class chasm in America that's opened up the sort of the meritocratic squeezed squeeze that has pushed, you know, meritocratic elites to the top 10%, which is Virginia, how I would identify the elite and then pushed a lot of people sort of to the bottom. Um, and that college divide being um, both one of culture and one of economics, um, although those don't map perfectly onto each other as Thomas pointed out. Um, and I would say that I think that the problem, one of the major problems, and, and again, I want to take this away from who's suffering and more towards the threat to democracy, is that um, a tiny elite in America now has all of the politicians speaking to them and all of the media created for them, and there's nobody speaking to or for the bottom 90%. Mm -hmm. To me, the problem is that we have put such a premium on a college education and robbed people who don't have it of dignity, and that we, we the educated, the overeducated, like everybody on this call, like frequently um, show our contempt for those without a college degree while winning everything, all of the political representation, all of the media representation. So I would say the first thing we, should, we need to do is focus, that's why my book is so much about um, the dignity of the working class is it's really about balancing again about creating a countervailing force to the massive power of the elites today the highly educated elites on the left and the you know economic elites on the right um, and so like one of the things we can do is think about you know wh what does it mean to start to respect people again who don't have that education and how can we institutionalize that respect these people don't want more welfare what they want are jobs that give them dignity, that allow them to play an active role in building up this nation. You know, they don't want a universal basic income. You know, they don't want to live at the beneficence of the elites. They want to be playing an active role in building up this nation by by working through the dignity of work. So I'd say the first thing we should do is like tell our kids when they're going to college, like, by the way, you're not all that for having this education. Like it, it's a different pathway for you. Maybe this is where your gifts are, 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 are shunting you. but but there is everybody deserves dignity right everybody needs to play an active role in building up this nation um and i would say the second thing is people often ask me like where can i get good information where can i get good news and i think another problem we have is like it's like why do you have to know everything like why is it so <laughs> important to know everything to know every minute of you know like let's, let's look at what's going on with the democrats right now like all of this finagling over the infrastructure bill right and the reconciliation bill like something's going to come out of that you know it will have taken two months of like bitter mm -hmm. infighting and then they're going to create like two really great bills and they're going to pass them both why do we have to be up on every single moment of that? That's culture war issues. You know, that mm -hmm. need to know mm -hmm. 
is such a culture war thing. And it's yes. just like, just why do we have to know everything? Like, you know what I mean? If something important is going to happen, you'll find out about it. And the moment when you are called upon to exercise your exercise your civic duty and play an active role in building up this nation, going to vote, whatever it is, you can look it up the day before. I think that this premium on knowing and knowing the truth mm. and knowing the right thing is a lot of where we've sort of ended up. And of mm -hmm. course, is tied into that sort of college chasm. And Vajja, thank you for selling a nice project on the dignity of work. Um, the Human Dignity Project <laughs> is one of our major initiatives. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and thank you, despite being a socialist, you laid out an <laughs> amazingly clear and articulate case for exactly what we're trying well, to do. The, the excellent AEI. thing so is that the excellent thing is dignity and jobs are also big words from our centrist president. So it seems yes, like what we've absolutely. pointed out once again, that with center left president, that we are all in agreement on everything, <laughs> that a more perfect union um, is, uh, is Batia's real subtitle here. Um, I do think <laughs> that, um, you know, and we should point out that the, you know, the current, the current president who woke media seemed to favor um, was, uh, you know, has uh, support from the industrial Midwest, where there are a lot of uh, working class people who, you know, were not interested in Hillary Clinton, who I know comes in for a special, um, sp you know, special vituperation in your book, Batya. Um, and, um, and I've come around to think that, you know, neoliberalism was no longer serving this country. Um, but that, you know, we are in this moment where like Trump has been defeated. We can't continue to talk as though, you know, it's two years ago um, and um, and defeated by a president that, you know, even Sam has some views in common with. Absolutely. Oh, no, I have quite a few views in common with, with, with Biden. That's that's certainly not a problem. Um, so Thomas, I, I wanna... are you anti Biden? Oh. No, I'm not no, at all. I, 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 with everything, it's mixed. Everything is mixed. Yeah which puts me in some tr trouble sometimes, but it is also a great virtue, uh, which is, you know, it's complicated to use the old Facebook status update, uh, yeah. the relationship status. <laughs> I, I do love this point. I mean, I, I've never heard someone make that. Why do you need to know everything? But that's a great point. <laughs> I mean, I, I tend to refer people to fiction if they're looking for, I mean, Netflix or novels. Um, if you want to address culture, drink from upstream where culture calls itself culture. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, Bhatti, I think you're absolutely right about that. And um, I know we have to turn to some audience questions. We just uh, received one uh, for everybody, um, which is how do we define wokeness? Uh, many ideas that were commonplace in the late 20th century are now universally considered racist or sexist by the political left and right. Uh, could woke ideology really just be ideology that is before its time? I would love to answer that first and then hear how both of you answer that. Please. Because I think it's such an important question. When I say woke, I don't mean um, uh, agitating for police reform. Like police reform is one of my number one issues. I don't mean fighting against mass incarceration. These are extremely important issues. I don't mean the wealth gap. What I mean by woke is the sort of Kendi view that you are either race anti-racist or racist, meaning in every moment you have a choice to be actively talking about race and fighting it, quote unquote, or to be complicit in it. To me, that is a moral panic because it, it demands that it be there all the time, that it be prioritized, meaning that we put a person's race before their humanity. And, and, and when I, I'm specifically talking about what happens to this when uh, educated white liberals get their hands on it, because then it really gets divorced from um, uh, a class-based analysis that could actually help people. It gets divorced from things like police reform and it turns into slogans like defund the police that actually are very much in the economic interests of the highly educated liberal elite. And so it's really about that sort of um, um, divorcing fighting racism from the actual work, the actual policy on the ground that working class Americans of color would like to see and putting it into the hands of um, a very highly mobile meritocratic liberal elite in a way that benefits them as and, and, and really deplatforms the views of those working class Americans. So again, it's really not about fighting racism for me. That's not what I mean when I say the media has gotten woke. I mean that it is perpetuating a moral panic, a, a racial binary um, that is a power binary that gives all the power to the quote unquote white supremacist 
um, white Americans and takes all the power away from um, people of color, which is not how people of color see themselves and I think is dehumanizing and dangerous and dangerous for democracy. Um, great. Now I really want to hear how both of you define it because this is such Thomas, a if you could jump in first on that. Sure. Yeah. I'm, so I don't really like this term and I don't use it. Uh, I'm working on a new book that's trying to grapple with some of these same questions, but I find that the term uh, for whatever reason is no longer used by any of the people that it describes and it's only used in a kind of pejorative sense. And so um, like Virginia said several times, um, people are working with different definitions. Uh, you have to always state what you mean if you use the term because it might be misunderstood. So I, I find it a really, um, it's, it's unfortunate because it's actually such a perfect word. It's, it's, it's very, the way it started, it, it really described something uh, that people um, didn't see as pejorative. It described not being fooled. It's the same thing that people on the right use red pill to connote in some ways, um, not sleepwalking through life. But I think when I talk about some of the things that Bhatia is talking about, I try to use the actual truth. So I, I think you have to get more specific. It's a constellation of things that are often lumped together, like what is called anti-racism, which would not be what previous generations of people would have thought uh, anti the word anti-racism means, but this kind of thing that Kendi sells, which is a binary view of all policies, all ideas, and all actions. Um, it would also have to encompass a certain kind of mainstreaming of very niche ways of thinking about gender, uh, you know, that are coming out of Judith Butler and other other scholars. Um, it, that is a part of what we put under the umbrella of wokeness. Um, so are some political, uh, I, I mean, uh, some economic uh, views that, you know, um, people term woke, uh, socialism and things like that, even like a kind of rejuvenation of, of, of Marxism and communism even. Um, so these things are all, they're not all the same thing, but they oftentimes uh, are clustered together under a kind of, I don't know what to call it, an umbrella or something. It, it, it's, it's, not everybody subscribes to the prefix menu though. Some people are woke in some ways and, and are not woke in others. So I think we really, what that's a long way of saying, I think we need much more specific language if we wanna actually get a conversation that gets to the root of what's kind of driving us all crazy. Mm -hmm. Um. Virginia? Oh, um, I... Virginia, do you want to have uh, a number of other questions that we can uh, turn to? Yeah, let, let's, let's, let's move to the questions. Sure. And incidentally, uh, you know, from a professorial perspective, I, I just, Thomas, couldn't agree more. If a student uses the word woke, I'd say that's not good enough. What does it mean? Yeah, say what you mean. actually mean, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and, and that, that is a problem. And I think, uh, you know, Bacha has done a pretty good job trying to define it, but not defining terms. From a social science perspective, I can't measure it, and I have no idea how I would engage with it. Yeah. And you know, I, I agree, things are very, very sloppy, and, and and the binary approach, the world is far too complicated to have just a simple binary approach to any of this, in, in my view. Um, so no, I, I I completely agree. Another question we have, uh, which I think uh, I think we've all dealt with, is the hysteria over wokeness and speech policing. And the question is, will it ever dissipate? Will, um, will we exhaust ourselves uh, over this, or, or will it get worse? Um, you, one piece of data, incidentally, that because uh, I'm a data person, uh, that we've seen is that uh, the idea of cancellation is much more prominent among millennials uh, than Gen Zers. The slightly younger crowd, basically 24 and under right now, mm -hmm. is a lot less uh, interested in cancel culture than their slightly older uh, millennial mm -hmm. generation. Um, that's a little bit of optimism I have toward it, where I think slightly younger Americans uh, realize that cancellation is not necessarily a, a good thing. Uh, Bacha, I know, has published a couple of pieces that I've written about that. I'm yeah. um, so curious to know uh, what everyone thinks uh, about that question. Well, the, I'm, I'm, I've been working on a project with someone who is canceled and me too. Um, and um, he is interested in what kind of rehabilitation there might be. Um, and do I think that, you know, he's his like, you know, I won't say systemic, but you know, there were maybe 10 women who were, were abused by him at a pretty small shop. Um, it seems demonstrably true that they, you know, were, uh, were um, there was some quid pro quo, just to keep it in political terms. There was some EEOC violations, again, to keep it in political terms, not about individual suffering, but things, hostile work environment he, he was said to have created. So, are, are, you know, 
I'm interested in forgiveness and redemption as a, as a religious person, but I'm not quite sure, and he sees himself as having been canceled, that we want a world where that kind of cancellation is, is, uh, is somehow no longer allowed. And, and frankly, you know, I lost my contract at Yahoo News because I published something that they, that Marissa Mayer found embarrassing at parties that set, announced myself as a Christian. And, you know, she was the boss there. I mean, people, and I, and I had no kind of tenure. Um, it didn't violate anything. She could renew my contract or not. Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure that cancellation was, um, was something that we'd want to see disappear, even though it was my own. Um, so, you know, pe people canceled for, um, I don't know, uh, anti-Asian slurs on Twitter s several years ago. Maybe if it creates, see, if it's decided that it creates a hostile work environment or there's a massive hemorrhaging of people who can't work for this person because of her old tweets, um, I don't know. That seems like the usual firing thing. It's the usual, I can't work with someone I'm uncomfortable with. You know, I worked for Michael Eisner at Disney for a long time, and he happened not to like working with black people and women in high positions of power. He just was uncomfortable around them. And so he didn't hire them or he fired them if they were someone he inherited on the board. And I don't know. Do we want to stop that kind of cancellation? That seems like very free market. You work with the people you're comfortable with and people are no longer uh, comfortable with people who have anti-Asian slurs in their in their Twitter. I mean, it's a cold, hard world in the public sphere. And uh, and also there are some laws that govern this stuff. I mean, I, I don't think any of you would like to see a world where someone who had sexually abused, uh, sexually assaulted 10 people who worked for him wouldn't be canceled. Right. Are so the I, I priests think again, it's being, about... the defrocked priests, are the imprisoned priests being canceled? Right. No, I I, I, that's not, I that's we... another term that we have to define because I don't yeah, think that someone who sexually assaulted 10 people is being canceled. That's just violating oh. all types of laws. Right. If you sexually right. assaulted 10 people, that's not cancellation. Exactly. That's, that's but, I mean, this is the person, This I, that's why I said he considers himself having been canceled in Me Too. And you know, there's certain people at the fringes who feel like they flirted aggressively with someone one night and they shouldn't be held responsible for that. Um, so well, that's very they, different than an assault. Right. And, well, you know, right. I, I, think, I think that's the slippery slope that you write. It's an, an example of what does it mean to be canceled and what is too much or versus too little. Um, you know, I have not assaulted anyone. On the other hand, because I questioned identity politics, people attempted cancellation, which is a totally different sort of narrative. You know, there was and no- What does it mean they att attempted cancellation? Was that an I, AEI or Sarah Lawrence? Sarah Lawrence. I still have my tenure. They couldn't, they wanted to get rid of it, but tenure is tenure. And I wrote I mean, an article guess, based on data, but they didn't I, like that I questioned certain things. I gotta uh, say there was, um, there was, uh, you know, in the six seventies, there was, you know, my father was in academia and a colleague of his had cancer and used this as an explanation for why she couldn't publish. Um, and it was publisher perished days then. And it just seemed unfair to her that she, you know, had to publish this book because she was sick. And then to others, it seemed unsympathetic of the chair to not, you know, let her like not give her three more years to work on the book. These are just, these are That's traditional- not you okay, know? but yep. cancel culture are these limit cases where meh, everyone can decide if the person was kind of well intentioned or maybe they're not. No, I think cancel culture actually describes something real that's really exacerbated by technological change. I think that cancel culture isn't just like losing out on an opportunity or facing consequences of being held accountable. Oftentimes, it's that somebody uh advertently or oftentimes inadvertently um, transgresses some as yet to be established norm, some rapidly um, shifting norm is called out publicly in the new digital realm that exists that we all have to navigate without rules or guidelines, um, is called out, made an example of, and oftentimes their place of employment is targeted. And that, uh, that institution then has feels a barrage uh, and is unable to, in the heat of the moment, gauge how long it will last, how serious it's going to be, and wants the headache to go away and often doesn't do di due diligence to find out what the proper response should be or if there should be no response as often that would be the case and ends up just terminating the person or turning them into a kind of pariah in which their, 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 their pursuit of their livelihood is no longer viable. And then oftentimes, just as often as not even more often than not, it comes out that the person didn't even do the thing they're accused of and yet 
that story can never travel around the world as fast as the lie in the beginning did, and that person is left with their life in tatters. There are so many examples. Of so this. when I went to Income Zero and had to retrain in marketing after the after, you know, scientists, yeah, I think that that's uh, something you should be more upset about. I mean, upset. I thought we were not supposed to talk about our emotional experiences. I mean, I, I, that is well, the I game that I got into. To walk around not talking about their emotional experiences, but I think that you know, this sounds like um, something happened to you that sounds quite unfair to me. And I don't think that social media should be in the HR departments and on the mastheads of of these institutions. One of the smartest proposals I've encountered recently was. Uh, Balaji uh, Srinivasan uh, from Coinbase said that people should put in their contracts that there's a 90 day cooling off period that has to happen mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. um, their company can terminate them if there's a social media mm -hmm. um, tempest in a teapot. Uh, they, they just cannot react. Uh, they, they will violate the contract if they react too quickly. I think that that would solve That's a, a lot good of idea. problems. Actually. Oh my God, Coinbase, the truth coming from Coinbase, the uh, crypto platform I trade on. Um, no, I love this idea. I want I want this in my contract now. I know. I, I'm going to tell that to Andrew Wiley next time. I, I want that. The cooling off period. That's fantastic. Yes, things feel especially hot. I think there's um, there's definitely like a thermal idiom there. I also, I, I mean, for other, another time, I would love to talk about awake and asleep as two different ways, as as Thomas says, woke and not, and not, and also that strange participle that's akin to shook, um, that I think comes out of black English. <laughs> Does anyone say ebonics anymore? But it, it is odd. Yeah, that I, yeah like, I do. I got, I got, that was, I had somehow, I was being told by uh, woke white blue checks on Twitter that I was uh, using uh, inappropriate language when I described myself as having grown up speaking ebonics. So I was I was oh. educated by a kind of uh, elite white liberal. You should just tell it. your lived truth, and uh, they'll back down using that language. I um, mean, I did, yeah. So before we run out of time, um, I wanted to kick it back to Bacha, um, just because it's directly related to your book, and I know everyone has to go in a little bit. I can have quite a bit more time if we needed, but um, I, I like this question because it's actually a similar question to what I, I kept puzzling, which is with news outlets being more selective of what they can and cannot write. And this is where editors are, are surprisingly powerful. I, I've pitched a number of things and, and you know, if it doesn't fit the, what the editor wants, even if I'm very proud of the piece, if the piece is something I've spent years working on in terms of the data behind it, it doesn't really always matter. Uh, the question is, to what extent are we going to end up with basically a duality or a polarization of only right and left outlets? Um, can there be a middle? Um, is there really a, an objective news anymore? You know, I, I when I visit the UK or used to visit the UK pre-COVID, what I loved about it was was that um, when I would check into a hotel, if it were a nice hotel, they'd ask me what newspaper I'd like in the morning, and I'd always say all of them. Um, and then was giving me a funny look, and I said, "Don't no, read them all," and I loved it. Uh, sadly, my French is not good enough to do that when I've uh, visited France. But um, you know, I, I like that they're not purely objective. They say, "Here's our point of view, and we're we're going to go with it." Uh, you know, we talk about the New York Times as being paper of record, but it, you know, as I think you've said in the book, it's hard to be that if it clearly has a particular bend and ideology to it. Um, has there really ever been a middle? Uh, is there a demand for a middle? Will there be a nonpartisan or, or actually appropriate balanced news organization? Uh, you know, is there one left? Can we have one? Uh, or are we just going to see this sort of schism and this cleavage again? So thank you so much for that question, because uh, it allows me to go back to the book. Um, a lot of what I talk about in the book is how um, what looks to us like a partisan divide is actually a class divide. Um, and so if you look at the difference between, you know, so I'm, a, I'm an editor, so I, ha I have, you know, on one screen CNN and on the other screen Fox News all day. And the real difference between them is pretty much aesthetic. It, it really comes down to whether they're picturing um, a working class viewer or a viewer with a college degree. And the, the data backs this up, of course. Everybody's following analytics about who's watching, who's reading. Um, I think a lot of what we think of as partisanship or political divide is actually about class. And that's kind of how I see the divide in our media. I, I think partisanship is not a problem so long as everybody is represented, so long as there's someone who's partisan for every group. And the problem is, is that what we have now is a conservative media landscape that has abandoned the working class economically. And we have a liberal media landscape that has also now abandoned the working class economically 
but they also sneer at their values, right? You know, Fox News is really catering to that audience, but all they have to do is not sneer at their values to have a captive audience, right? They don't even ha have to talk about their economic um, incentives, which I really wish that they would. Um, I start the book by looking at the sort of heroes of 19th century American journalism mm -hmm. who were populists. They really believed that the point of the media, the point of newspapers was to wage a crusade on behalf of the poor and the working class. And of course, there were also newspapers for the elites. It just didn't matter that every paper was partisan because every subgroup had its paper. And you had the situation in the 1920s where there were so many communist newspapers in New York City that you would have people who had literally four or communist newspapers that they would never dream of reading. And these were communists, right? Because they had the communist newspaper that they read and everyone else was so you know, off base even though yeah. they were all communists, right? And that's obviously a plethora of riches, right? The problem is that because of the pressures of digital media, and I really go into this in depth in my book, um, all of the mainstream outlets, apart from the uh, object, you know, obviously conservative ones, are going for the same that same highly educated liberal elite. You know, that the, they're they oh, and they can because they can track how much money you make and where you live and what you do for a living. They can track all of this through data. They know exactly what to publish in order to get those eyeballs and that attention. And I think that's the real problem: is that it's not that the media is partisan; it's that all of the media is partisan on behalf of either the conservative conservative elite or the liberal, highly educated elite. That's the real problem here. And, um, you know, the only way that I think people can fix that, like, you know, you readers, like, you know, people who need, you know, want to get the news, you're not going to be able to change the New York Times. Like, the only thing you can change is, is your heart, right? Like, the only thing you can change is how you respond to this news. And I think that uh, a point I make repeatedly, and I'll just end with this, is that if you're reading something on the internet and you feel that surge of adrenaline, of rage, you feel like, enraged someone is making money someone is making a lot of money when you feel that feeling and you i would just urge people do not let your heart become the the place where somebody else's buck is being produced by making you hate your fellow american you have complete control over what happens in here and 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 i would urge you to take that back that control where, so the final, let me just do the final question then, uh, and I love this one. So where can they go for the genuinely nonpartisan <laughs> journalism? Where can people go to not have that rage, uh, to seek out news, whether it's a lot of news or a little news, you know, just uh, something, and then go, uh, you know, find their your non-political space, as you like to talk about, to sort of get a break from this sort of stuff. You know, a democracy is built on having, on tolerance, right? On having a muscle within you that, joys in encountering the views of people you disagree with. So, I mean, that, I mean, that's really the key is like, you have to exercise that muscle and a great way to do it is to read outlets that you disagree with. Of course, you have the ones that are catering to your views, but if you can find ones just like you do, Sam, that are catering to other people's views, read viewpoints from people you disagree with. Even better, go to synagogue, go to church, go volunteer, meet people in real life who you can disagree with because we're losing that muscle and, and without it, we're finished, right? We're, 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 we will no longer be a democracy. Got it. Um, like really quickly, I would just say, you know, which publications, I think Harper's does a very uh, good job of being genuinely uh, heterodox and publishing um, views and, and, uh, and stories that can um, align um, across a good amount of the political spectrum and, and upset uh, people on either side. <laughs> I think the Atlantic does that too, actually. The Atlantic uh, has quite a lot of writers who disagree with each other um, and doesn't toe a line the way that some of the other prestigious uh, publications tend to. Um, those, are, those are two magazines that I think you can, you can get. Um, and, and Newsweek, of course. Yes, the Newsweek, Newsweek. Yes, yes, I should say that as well. I thought you were asking about news. If you're asking about op-eds, definitely come to Newsweek. There are two editors who are liberals on the left and two who are conservative on the right. And every Voila. day you will find viewpoints that will make you very angry. Please come and read them. <laughs> but keep your heart and, pure. And, and, you know, look at the AI page. I mean, the fact that we have this going on at AI should shock people. And I'm thrilled we're doing it. We really do try to... Mm -hmm keep things balanced. It may not be a news outlet or research and policy, but but still, there, there, there are places that are trying to do this. We occasionally fail, but we're, we're absolutely trying. And and, uh, and I appreciate what Newsweek has been doing since it's a reincarnated version. So, <laughs> great. Let me just uh, put in a word for, for I mean, I'm not sure that uh, Harper's and 
where I once worked and the Atlantic, which I am currently writing the Buckley piece for, uh, really represent news sources. Um, if you're interested, writing for the LA Times and living in, in Brooklyn, I've learned a lot that you don't pitch a story on woke media or or uh, or even the infrastructure bill before checking whether the how the fires are, um, because that's going to be the front page of a California-based newspaper. So if you're interested in 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 the fires that um, are disproportionately, I mean, that hit the hit the West Coast, I think the LA Times is a great source. Um, there, um, there, you can. I, I'm a, I'm a fan of newsletters, not the Substack kind, but the kind that news gathering organizations put out. Choose it on your on the things you need to know. So so it's not about, I don't think we need differing views on the California fires. You really need to know if you, uh, you know, what the air quality is, um, what uh, I'm especially, I also love the um, vaccine newsletter from the New York Times just to talk about vaccine rates in the country because they're so heartening. Um, and, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, rather than reading, I mean, the Atlantic just had a story on why are we still wearing cloth masks? Now, I guess that doesn't fit the description of woke, but for heck's sake, like it starts out by saying, you know, someone's at writing about fashion that, you know, we used to get our seersucker things in the beginning of the vaccine and madras or whatever, but now <laughs> we should know that we need N95s. I mean, what are we talking about? Right. Like, I just don't need an essay on that that is meant to make me worry and buy N95s. You well, know, you got to have the N95s, though. This is where I'm than you. OK, <laughs> right. Well, so, OK, if this is maybe it's a woke thing, I don't know. But you I think have the N95. I, Are you kidding? I'm worried about you out there. <laughs> okay. I, 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 well, I don't have my seersucker either. I mean, I do have N95s. Actually, I was inspired to go to go to Amazon and buy N95s out of Back that. Up. I think health reporting is generally terrible and tells you, you know, mostly it's about how to be thin or how to like work <laughs> magic on people to like sell them things. Getting us too thin and too rich seems to be the goal of lots of <laughs> writing about habits and soft journalism. I hate that stuff. Um, but, you know, if you wanted, wanted to know about the Larry Nassar affair, the, the fate of Olympic gymnastics, the Michigan newspaper, I do one that's now turned into Michigan Live, um, which, is a, which is a website that you can get news from. I mean, choose the things you actually want to be informed about. Um, if you, if you want to sit around with people, you know, that make you feel part of something, and we all do, you know, watch a panel show on, uh, uh, watch Fox and Friends or watch uh, Rachel Maddow's show. But if you don't just want that warm feeling that you have friends that, you know, are, are Joanne Reed, if you just need to know some numbers about uh, hurricanes or about where, you know, in this case, in New York, there are like bike lanes being built and my partner's very interested in banning cars and bikes. Um, so he usually looks to see where the bike lanes are. These are I would go for newsletter letters on this and stay away from the the places with like a big feeling tone because as Batya says, if, if you're if you're uh, if you're being hit with cortisol, this is more assault than the free press. Mm -hmm. um, this is like meant to get into your bloodstream and and that either feels good or it doesn't. But I turn to Netflix for that. <laughs> So let's um, stop there. Uh, and I want to say thank you uh, to everyone who tuned in and joined us uh, around the world. Uh, thank you uh, to Thomas for joining us from uh, France. Thank you for um, Virginia Bacha uh, for joining us for, uh, here in New York. And uh, the book comes out uh, next week. Uh, again, it is a great cover. And we're not supposed to ju judge them by covers, but I absolutely <laughs> love this. And on the other side of the, uh, no, I really do. I mean, Come on, it's amazing. We, we, all, we all have a mutual friend who design, helped design the cover, right, but <laughs> Yes. <laughs> this, was, this was the brilliance of Alana Newhouse. It was uh, her sure. idea. Yeah. Got it. So Alana did a great job. Uh, and I rarely yeah. say that about cover, but this is a great cover. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So, Thank you all so much for this. What a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks, Bacha. Bacha. It's such Congrats. it's such a good book. And can, yeah, congratulations on it. Everyone listening, really do buy it because the storytelling, which we didn't get into. Um, about the 19th century uh, press, I think, especially is really, really compelling and great. Thank you so much. And, follow, and feel free to follow all of us on Twitter, but uh, of course, log off and go outside and spend some time uh, <laughs> away from it to avoid you know, too much cortisol. So uh, thank you all. <laughs> we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone.